Hello, everyone, and uh, a very warm welcome to you all to uh, this, what we hope will be a wonderful conference on uh, disability and social change, disability philosophy and social change. Uh, the history of the conference or the origin of the conference were a, a couple of email exchanges between Shelley Tremaine uh, and myself that uh, I'd put on a couple of conferences. And Shelley asked me why I didn't put on conferences where disabled philosophers spoke about disability. And I thought about that. And I thought well, she's quite right. I hadn't done that. So let's do it properly. I asked Shelley whether she would like to collaborate with me on the project. And she did. And Shelley uh, put together this incredible program that we have over the next three days. Uh, I'm delighted to be hosting it on behalf of the Blavatnik School of Government that you can see behind me, who are providing the support for this event. And the financial support has come from the Alfred Landaker Foundation, who uh, support my chair here at the school. And the uh, Alfred Landaker Foundation is named after a German Jewish man who died at the hands of the Nazis. And the program is set up to support uh, investigation into minority rights and the uh, stability of democracy. And it feels very appropriate to be sponsoring this conference on disability as part of that program and in uh, honor of the name of Alfred Landica, as of course so many people, hundreds of thousands of disabled people lost their lives to the Nazis and went through forced sterilization. So disability and social change is something very much linked to this research program. I'll hand over to Shelley just in a moment, but I just want to make sure that you're all aware of the captioning, the live captioning that we've arranged for you by AI media. Um, you should be able to turn on the captioning by looking on the bottom of your screen, there's a button that says CC, closed caption. If you press that, it gives you options either for subtitles or for the transcript. You, you can work out for yourselves which is better. If you're uh, slightly confused about it, go back to the email that sent you the link that you clicked on to get here and that has more information. So now uh, let me hand over to Shelley. Thank you. Like Jonathan, I want to welcome everyone who has joined us for the first day of this path-breaking conference of critical philosophical work on disability by disabled philosophers. Before I introduce this remarkable event, I want to acknowledge that the land from which I'm joining the conference is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg, covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and directly adjacent to Haldeman Treaty territory. On behalf of the organizers and participants of philosophy, disability and social change, I want to humbly offer the teachings of this conference with respect and in the spirit of decolonization. This conference is testament to both the growth of philosophy of disability as a bona fide subfield of philosophy and the determination of disabled philosophers whose work remains largely marginalized in favor of medicalized understandings of disability that construe it as politically neutral and prior to social power. Indeed, philosophy, disability, and social change challenges members of the philosophical community in at least five ways. That is, challenges philosophers to first think more critically about the metaphysical and epistemological status of disability. Second, closely examine how philosophy of disability is related to the di tradition and discipline of philosophy. 
Third, acknowledge the continuing exclusion of disabled philosophers from the profession of philosophy. Fourth, seriously consider how philosophy and philosophers contribute to the pervasive inequality and social subordination that disabled people confront. And fifth and finally, philosophy, disability and social change challenges philosophers to develop mechanisms designed to transform the current professional and institutional position of disabled philosophers in particular, and the economic, political, and social position of disabled people more generally. Over the next three days, you will be presented with cutting edge philosophy of disability that both highlights the diversity and range of philosophical approaches to critical work on disability and showcases the heterogeneity with respect to race, gender, nationality, sexuality, culture, age, and class of the community of disabled philosophers. It is now my distinct pleasure and honor to hereby commence what will surely be an outstanding conference. Our first presenter is Julie E. Maybe, whose preferred pronouns are she, her. I first met Julie on email when at the urging of Jesse Prince, she contacted me about one of my articles. Julie has also been featured in Dialogues on Disability, the series of interviews with disabled philosophers that I run on the Biopolitical Philosophy blog. Julie Maybe is Professor and Chair of the Department of Philosophy at Lehman College of the City University of New York, as well as the director of Lehman's interdisciplinary disability studies minor and a teacher in the disability studies master's program for Cooney's School of Professional Studies. She is the author of two books, Picturing Hegel, an illustrated guide to Hegel's Encyclopedia Logic published by Lexington Books in 2009, and Making and Unmaking Disability, the Three-Body Approach, published by Roman and Littlefield in 2019. Please join me in welcoming Julie Maybe and use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions and comments for Julie to Katie Tyner, our moderator. A reminder that captioning is available through the CC button, which can also be found at the bottom of your screen. Thank you so much, uh, Shelley, and thanks to you and Jonathan for organizing such a terrific uh, conference. Uh, I'm going to start uh, my uh, sharing my uh, presentation now. Um, I hope everyone can see it. Let me know uh, if there's a problem. Um, so for today, uh, I wanted to pick up on some themes that I developed in the book you mentioned, Shelley, uh, to, uh, to try to answer the question, what can philosophers do to unmake disability or to change our society to improve the lives of disabled people? I'd like to propose that philosophers adopt a particular general strategy for unmaking disability or promoting social change for disabled people, which I will illustrate by talking about Japanese bathrooms. The sociologist Irving K. Zola once wrote about a, how amazed he was about a Japanese public bathroom that he encountered in his travels. According to his description, the bathroom had a number of stalls with different options, a Japanese style squatting toilet, a squatting toilet with grab bars, a Western style toilet, a Western style toilet uh, with grab bars, a large official handicap stall 
with toilet gr and grab bars that were movable up and down, for, as he pointed out, which allowed for all manner of transfer, and two sizes of urinals that flushed automatically, also with grab bars all around for gripping uh, wherever needed. Uh, as you can see in the photo I got off the internet, uh, the photo of a Japanese bathroom on the bottom includes a very deep uh, sink, which is supposedly to allow for the cleaning of colostomy bags, uh, according to the poster of the photo. Zola used the example to suggest that disability is not a fixed or static status or an either or category, but a continuum. Whereas US bathrooms have either bare bones stalls for supposedly non-disabled people or designated handicapped stalls for supposedly disabled people, he suggested the Japanese bathrooms treated disability as a continuum by providing a range of mobility options in all of the stalls. But I would like to suggest that the Japanese bathrooms provide us with a more general formula for unmaking disability. Unlike the US bathrooms, the Japanese bathrooms do not seem to rely on classifying people at all. So I'd like to suggest instead of focusing on classifying people like the Japanese bathrooms, we should focus on classifying types of access and we should do so along what I will describe as three dimensions of embodiment. So let me now turn to embodiment. We can define embodiment generally, I think, as what it is like as an object and what it feels like from the inside, as it were, to move about in the world. Preliminarily, uh, following anthropologists Nancy Shepard Hughes and Margaret M. Locke, I'd like to say that there are three layers or three dimensions of embodiment or what we'll call the three bodies, though my terms for these are different from uh, theirs. The first body is the personal body which is uh, what an individual person's body is like insofar as it is an object, as well as what it feels like from the inside or how it is experienced. The interpersonal body is how bodies are defined and experienced in interpersonal relations and social roles. And the institutional body is how bodies are defined and experienced in large institutions and structures, including the economic system of capitalism. I'd like to note that this division into the three bodies is only preliminary, however, because in some cultures, the personal body uh, is already regarded as socially connected to others, and so is not regarded as or experienced as personal, which is why in the diagram on the slide, I have placed a dashed uh, oval around the figure representing the personal body. In Gahukagama culture, for example, in Papua New Guinea, people regarded themselves as most themselves when they are in physical contact with others. In uh, the Suya or making siege uh, society of Brazil, for example, uh, they believe in the existence of substance groups. So they believe that they share a body with those people with whom they share uh, bodily fluids, semen, uh, blood, uh, spit, and so on. So in many cultures, uh, there is no conception of a personal body. Indeed, anthropologists Nancy Shepard Hughes and Margaret M. Locke have argued that while all humans have some form of what we call proprioception and a sense of being in the world, the modern conception of an individual self is a recent invention, even in the West. <clears throat> Still, 
If we use the division into the three bodies as a preliminary device for thinking about embodiment, let me start by asking, what can philosophers do to unmake disability in terms of the third body, the institutional body? I want to begin by saying something briefly about how capitalism came to create or define disability as an inability to labor in the capitalist wage market. A definition that is still active today, for instance, in social security law in the United States. As historian Irina Metzler has suggested, as capitalism spread, people increasingly came to be paid for the time that they work which created productivity requirements in which physical abilities became relatively more important than before and narrowed the definition of what counts as genuine economic activity. These factors excluded some people from the wage market, defining them as disabled in the sense of being unable to labor in the capitalist wage market. Anthropologist Ida Nicolaisen noticed a similar change in the status of people we would regard as disabled among the Punanba people of the central region of the island of Borneo in Malaysia. As the Punanba began relying more heavily on cash income from wages during the 1980s, less importance was given to the subsistence activities that people we would regard as disabled were doing. And there were fewer as well as fewer kinds of tasks that they were able to carry out, tasks that had previously given them social value. Here, I'd like to suggest that philosophers follow Cornell West's advice when he argued in 1983 that the principal task of the Afro-American philosopher is, as he put it, quote, to keep alive the idea of a revolutionary future, a better future different from the deplorable present, a state of affairs in which multifaceted, the multifaceted oppression of Afro-Americans and others is, if not eliminated, alleviated. This task, West said, requires the aid of a sophisticated analysis and criticism of capitalism. But there's capitalism and there's capitalism. You might think that the shift, <clears throat> pardon me, to a deindustrialized capitalist economy based on providing services would make it easier for disabled people to access the wage uh, market. The economy, after all, is now dominated by informal part-time and temporary jobs and contracts for individual projects and a variety of personal services. This flexibility might seem able to help at least some disabled people gain access to the job market. In fact, however, deindustrialization has not helped. Instead, it has led to increased global competition, which has placed a greater emphasis on economic growth and efficiency and led to higher requirements in terms of skills and efficiency for workers. Indeed, uh, Guy Standing, uh, the economist Guy Standing has argued that deindustrialization has produced the class of people that he calls the precariat. Uh, we look, need look no further than our own backyards uh, for such a group at CUNY, for example, for an example, 56% uh, of classes are now taught by adjuncts who as contract workers cobble together a precarious living across a number of different campuses, have large numbers of students and are required to teach multiple topics and use multiple computer platforms. So the amount of skill that they now need, uh, one skill, one of my adjuncts once told me he developed is that he can now grade papers while riding the subway standing up. Indeed, the economist Ben Baumberg-Geiger has argued that deindustrialization is actually reconstructing what counts as disability today by pushing more people with health conditions out of the wage market. 
applications for incapacity or disability benefits have been increasing all across the OECD countries, which is ironic since overall population has uh, uh, overall population uh, health has been improving and work is becoming generally less physically demanding. Baumberg has argued that changing work conditions, especially the loss of control over work and time, are pushing people with health conditions out of the wage market. Here, I'd like to suggest that philosophers apply the general strategy proposed earlier in the discussion of the Japanese bathrooms. Instead of classifying individual people, philosophers need to help classify and expand access to genuine economic activity. Studies show that individualistic strategies, for example, job training, individual job training, do not work. Philosophers should advocate for strategies that involve changing the employment context, for example, wage subsidies or money for employers to make work environments more accessible. They should also insist that re employers require only skills that are needed to do a job. Indeed, as Baumberg suggests, we should go further and actually redefine what counts as genuine economic activity beyond wage labor, paid housework, family work, club work, and what is now volunteer work and cooperative labor systems, as well as favor credits, for example, exchanging work for free childcare are uh, things we should consider. The feminist, here, the feminist project of reimagining the economy that as for example, Nancy Fraser uh, engaged in uh, is would be a project that uh, that I would recommend, but with an eye to the specific position of disabled people. So uh, the reimagining the economy will have to take account of the broader civil rights needs that disabled people have, such as access to transportation, as well as unrecognized forms of work that disabled people do. For instance, the extra time for that it takes for tasks or stress a ride which is a joke about the new york paratransit system which is actually called access a ride but given how much time spe people spend waiting around for rides uh people in new york call it stress a ride a stress a ride there's also patient work and biographical work that disabled people often have to do when they have to explain uh, things to uh, other people about their biography or about their health conditions. Philosophers also need to work to unmake the values that have been associated with capitalism. For example, to reject the capitalist co connection between citizenship rights and social status and paid labor. Following Kristen Miller's analysis of the neurodiversity movement, philosophers should also work to replace the connection between citizenship rights and social status and being normal with a notion of quirky citizenship as the Japanese bathrooms do. Well, what can philosophers do to unmake disability in terms of the second body, the interpersonal body? Remember that the interpersonal body refers to how embodiment is defined in terms of interpersonal relationships and social roles. Feminist sociologist Oyeronke Oyewumi has pointed out just how focused Western societies are on bodies, male, female, Jewish, Aryan, black, white, rich, poor, she writes, and we can add disabled. Interpersonal relations are also affected by what we can think of as bodily capital. Here, we can think that the normal body is a form of privately held capital that can be converted into value in interpersonal context. Having a body that looks and behaves normally may be even more important in a deindustrialized economy today that is focused on providing services. As Guy Standing has observed, personal deportment skills uh, 
looking good, having a winning smile, a well-timed witticism are now more important for employment uh, than they were before. Another phenomenon is the phenomenon of disability spread. Uh, an, another phenomenon that uh, exhibits the importance we place on bodies in interpersonal relations. Disability spread is the idea that when a non-disabled person encounters a disabled person, in the mind of the non-disabled person, the status of disability spreads, as it were, over the whole, the disabled person's whole identity. Well, some sociologists have called this the phenomenon of disability as a master status. Oyuwumi has argued that the emphasis on bodies in Western society is rooted in a privileging of sight over the other senses. As she writes, in cultures where the vi visual sense is not privileged, the body is not read as a blueprint for society. As she also writes, a concentration on vision as the primary mode of comprehending reality promotes what can be seen over that which is not apparent to the eye. It misses the other levels and the nuances of existence. As philosophers, we must promote paying more attention to other levels and nuances of existence. For example, place greater emphasis on identities defined by social relationships and other non-visible characteristics. Here, a poem by the African-American poet Pat Parker can be helpful. In her poem entitled, For the White Person Who Wants to Know How to Be My Friend, the first two lines are, the first thing you do is forget that I'm black. Second, you must never forget that I'm black. Here I'd suggest the lesson is that we need to focus not on bodies, but on embodiment along all the dimensions, on the wider socio-political contexts in which people navigate the world. In terms of social roles, Disabled people have been and are systematically denied access to the full range of adult social roles, particularly the roles of sexual partner and parent. We need to reconstruct our social world to provide disabled people with access to valued social roles, including those. For example, we need to define disabled people as sexual citizens with a right to new modes of access to sex. We need to help change the social structures, personal assistance services, group homes to provide disabled people with access to sex, a, a move that requires undercutting the idea that sex is private. We can also define parental competence as a feature of parents' social networks rather than of individual parents. None of us, after all, raises our children alone. And we can promote interdependent living skills and arrangements that and competence in relationship building and advocacy. Well, what can philosophers do to unmake disability in terms of the first body, the personal body? In terms of the experience of the personal body, we tend to think of the experiences of our own bodies as simply given. But Zola argued that experiences of the personal body are actually socially defined. He gave the example of feeling tired, sore, and cramped after traveling by airplane and argued that that experience was structured by the social context, not only by the structure or design of the airports, which had long hallways that he had to walk down using his brace and his cane, but also the social expectations that shaped his behavior, the idea that he must complete tasks in as normal a way as possible, that is by walking. When once Zola started using uh, wheelchairs to navigate airports, he found that he didn't arrive at his destinations tired, sore, and cramped. And that's what led him to realize just how that experience of traveling had been structured by social context. Here, philosophers need to redefine social context, including social expectations that define how disabled people experience their own bodies. 
In terms of what the personal body is as an object in the world, I would like to suggest that it too is socially defined. We can begin to see how it is socially defined by thinking about Nietzsche's observation that concepts are metaphors. They treat a bunch of things that aren't exactly alike as if they are alike and forget about the differences. The philosopher Norwood Russell, uh, uh, Norwood Russell Hansen argued that while language does not produce what we think about, it does form or organize what we perceive as the facts. As Ifani Mankiti has argued, socially shared languages also define how we identify ourselves and are identified by others as objects or facts in the world. People identify themselves and others as facts in the world using the languages that they speak, languages that determine how they think about the world. A person's identity is therefore defined by him or herself as well as by others by reference to the facts identified by their languages. Putting Mankiti's and Hansen's views together, we could say that languages and our socially shared conceptual systems shape the facts that we perceive, including about what other people are like or their identities as objects in the world. In the Middle Ages in Europe, for example, words that were used to refer to what we think of as individual physical conditions or impairment, debilitated, weak, impotent, for example, also referred to socioeconomic statuses. So a widow, for example, would be would be uh, referred to using those same terms, suggesting that there was no clear distinction between physical conditions and social conditions. Disability and impairment are highly abstract concepts that don't exist in many cultures, particularly small scale societies in which people are defined primarily by social relationships and roles. To unmake disability in terms of the first or personal body then, philosophers will have to burst the dominant socially shared perceptual bubble that constructs the identity of people we regard as disabled. Coming to see people we define as disabled on their own terms will require bursting the dominant perceptual bu bubbles. We must come to see, and as Oyewumi suggests, hear, touch, smell, taste the world differently and perceive different facts. One thing philosophers can do is work to abandon the deficit thinking that is built into the concept of disability, characterizing people only in terms of what they cannot do given the current environments fails to take account of their corporeal powers. So we must acknowledge corporeal powers that are inseparable from the vulnerability. For example, activist Sonara Taylor's ability to carry her coffee in her mouth, or Christina, a blind and deaf student that David Good wrote about, her skill in alternative, what he called alternative object readings. Because Christina did not speak a language, she was not uh, guided in her work with objects by what objects were supposedly for. So he found she had a great skill in using objects differently. Deficit thinking fails to take account of the ways in which social contexts construct people's incapacities. For example, in special education tests, we drag students into small rooms with strangers who pepper them with questions in completely out of context and then wonder why students can't seem to do things. Here again, we must return to the lesson learned from Zola's encounter with the Japanese bathrooms. Instead of classifying people, we need to remake socially defined environments, including our languages and concepts in ways that construct the widest variety of people as capable and as able to access our socially defined and our social world. Let me just end with a, some brief remarks on philosophical method. The first thing I'd like to suggest is that doing what I have proposed here that philosophers should do, 
uh, suggests some change in philosophical method. Philosophers should take account of the conditions on the ground, which often requires stepping out of philosophy into other disciplines. We should also think of concepts as the products of living human beings in their context. If concepts are human made, then they can be changed or abandoned. Finally, I recommend thinking historically and multiculturally, that is getting out of our conceptual and perceptual bubbles. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Julie. Sorry. I'm now going to um, ask um, some of the questions that have been posed. <coughs> Wonderful. Um, all of the questions are quite interesting. Um, the first one I'm going to um, push you is from Juso. I I'm sorry if I mispronounce his name. Um, Oop, that question just disappeared. <coughs> that question literally disappeared. Okay, I'm going to ask a question from David Lawson, who says that, um, who thinks your presentation is excellent, Julie, and uh, wonders how people with the visible disabilities, invisible disabilities, pardon me, fit into your understanding of disability and its association with embodiment? Oh, thanks for the great question. Um, so in, in people with invisible disabilities struggle, tend to struggle with a different problem uh, from the problem that people with visible disabilities uh, often face in interpersonal contexts. So for example, uh, someone with an invisible disability, when a non-disabled person uh, engages with them, they appear normal. And so then uh, the person, the non-disabled person, assumes that the, the person can do everything like everybody else, right, in the, in the normal, supposedly normal way. And so people with invisible disabilities their struggle is then to try to convince people that they can't do these things. But <clears throat> so the once we take into consideration the wider social context of embodiment, then we can take into account these kinds of interpersonal um, tensions and, uh, and problems and address them. Uh, just as we do uh, with other uh, questions of embodiment. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question comes from uh, Juso uh, Nieman. Sorry if I mispronounced that name. Um, uh, who enjoyed hearing about the three bodies and uh, wondered about the example of the blurred lines between personal and interpersonal body. Uh, and um, was wondering if there could be a similar uh, blurring between personal and institutional bodies and uh, thought that this uh, referred back to Foucault's understanding of biopower and wondered if there is a way to separate, at least in the con a, a blurring of the personal and institutional bodies, at least in modern, the context of modern societies. And was wondering uh, if there's a way to separate the, the personal and the institutional body. Um, that's a great point. I hadn't really thought about um, blurring the line between the interpersonal and the uh, institutional uh, bodies. And I, I mean, I think it's, it, I, I, it's a, 
it's a very appealing, uh, friendly amendment, I, I guess, because <clears throat> my, my, my main idea is just that this is just a way of thinking, but I don't, from our point of view, largely, but I'm not recommending it as a permanent, right, or definitive breakdown of embodiment. Uh, it's just w a way to think about different sort of co embodiment contexts, if you will. And I think they are all kind of blurred and maybe there should be four, and who knows, maybe five. Uh, but so I'd, I'd be open to that kind of blurring, certainly, and to thinking about more about the ways in which the, the levels that I'm using here just as a heuristic device really are blurred. So I think that's a, that's a wonderful question. Okay, that was a great answer. And here's another question um, from uh, Melinda Hall, who will be presenting on Friday. Um, and she, Melinda, wants to thank you for your fabulous talk. And she was wondering about the idea of unmaking disability through um, removing barriers to adulthood or adult roles. Uh, Melinda was wondering, is there any sense in which you think the interpolation of the child or the adult comes from ableism and capitalism? Melinda worries that shoring up the idea, the current idea of adult might play into this. Another excellent uh, suggestion that I hadn't uh, thought about. Um... And the, the, you know, I'm open to bursting my perceptual bubble in any way possible. <clears throat> Pardon me. So I think that's another excellent suggestion. What you know, what to what degree have uh, the roles of child and adult been defined by capitalism? Um, to what degree should we be skeptical about them? Um, I, I think those are all. <clears throat> Pardon me, excellent questions, <clears throat> to which I don't have um, have answers and that I hadn't thought about, but it, it, an excellent idea. Okay, the next question comes from uh, Jenny Clark Schiff, and she wants to thank you for your wonderful talk, and was wondering if you could elaborate on the way that philosophy about disability and philosophers with disabilities can inform and transform the playing field with respect to legal activism and access to civil rights? Um, well, uh, I mean, I think philosophers can do a lot I and mean, we have organizations associations um, as individuals we can belong to associations um, we can promote these things in our um, personal lives um, so i think there is a lot of uh, room for philosophers to do things uh, you know this is a discussion that for example I've had with um, with my, some of my uh, daughter, uh, my daughter who is disabled and um, had various kinds of uh, therapists. Um, you know, one of the things I challenged them about was, you know, is it enough for an occupational therapist, for example, to uh, just you know be working in a clinic? Are there not political things that occupational therapists should do also to try to, for example, make places more accessible in the city, uh, for instance? And so, I mean, I think the same thing can be asked of, of philosophers, uh, you know, and taking Cornell West's suggestion seriously. Uh, and certainly there is a lot of more specific work than I've discussed here, Shelley, some of your own work on what philosophers can do um, to make, uh, to, to help ac uh, disabled people access 
uh, not only the social world generally, but the philosophy, uh, the philosophy profession itself as well. So I think that other uh, scholars have focused more specifically, certainly on that question, like you, Shelley. Okay, here's a question from um, R. Karav Karavika, who thanks you for your powerful presentation and is wondering if you can elaborate on the alternative forms of economic activity in order to decommodify labor, as you said. Um, this questioner notes that we're witnessing ongoing struggle to include disabled people into open labor markets through policies and practices overlooking the possibility to think wider and recognize the ways that income security could be guaranteed except through the except through wages yeah i, I mean I, i'm there are uh, economists who've done some of this work uh, feminist philosophers have thought about it though we 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 have to be careful about the issue of care um, when it comes to disabled people but but i think the the basic idea is is to find ways of economically rewarding work that is outside of wage labor. And one of those involves making what's now volunteer work, uh, rewarding that economically. Um, I, again, I'm not an expert in this area, but uh, I think about my own daughter, for example, who has many wonderful characteristics. For instance, um, she has a way of making people feel like they're the most important person in the room. And she's very socially skilled. And when she, she, she has worked with elderly people, for example, she plays game with them, games with them, and they love her. And yet it's very difficult for her to get a full-time job um, doing this kind of work. If there were a way to reward economically um, this and other kinds of, of work, I think that um, disabled people would be able to participate much more broadly in our economy than they already do. And indeed, one of the things about deindustrialization that I tried to point towards is that it's actually making work life worse for everybody. And so uh, we have a lot of incentive, I think, to rethink um, the current work arrangements under capitalism. Okay, we have a few more minutes left. Um, Here's a question from Raphael Morris, who asks, um, and this is a question that I often confront, um, in terms of unmaking disability and deficit thinking, and in particular the personal body, how can we undertake this task but nevertheless ensure that we affirm the lived experiences of people with conditions like chronic pain and chronic fatigue. Conditions that are, and um, this is contestable, inherently bad and that shouldn't be euphemized or dismissed as social artifacts. Yeah, so, so um, my my claim is not that uh, disability is made up or out of whole cloth, uh, that there, there are experiences there, there's there there, but what changes is how we identify and define it, how we cut up the world. So, uh, so think of mental illness, for example, what we call mental illness, uh, right? Is, is no one is denying that certain people experience distress, right? And there are just lots of different kinds of distress. And, but 
how we define the stress, the concept of mental illness has this whole, a whole baggage with it that, so for example, that it is like a physical condition, right? It's an illness, which is a physical illness, that it's, that it's uh, in a person's body. That it, so the concepts that we use to cut up the world shape how we perceive the world, what, how we understand what that distress is like. And so I'm not suggesting that we, that there isn't distress. It's a question of how we understand and identify that distress, what concepts we use to understand and identify. It. So in no way am I suggesting that there isn't a real thing called distress. Um, but as we know, uh, some uh, psychologists have talked about, you know, one of the things that happens when there's a, a disaster is that Western countries will send psychologists in to help people process supposedly the disaster. And in some cases, the local people actually sent the psychologists away because they found, they, they found that the approaches that the psychologists took were totally misguided, for example, uh, one person in one source I read said, you know, they wanted us to sit in dark rooms and talk about uh, what had happened. Instead, we want to go outside in the sun and dance, right? And so, so it's not that there isn't distress. It's a question of how we understand the distress, what concepts we use, and then what those concepts tell us we need to do to address the distress. I don't know if that helps, but... Um, I thought that was an excellent answer, Julie. Thank you. I think this will be our last question. Um, Balam Kenter um, asks, uh, how would cognitive disabilities figure in the three-dimensional embodiment approach? And wonders if we need different conceptualizations of subjectivity, agency, and interdependency, as well as care, needs, and values? Um, so it, it's a great question. Uh, I, again, I'm open to all kinds of reconceptualizations. Um, I think all that thinking is great. Uh, cognitive disability is a topic that's close to my heart in light of my family's uh, situation and my daughter. And I think that I think that you can, it, you know, you can roughly, you can think roughly about cognitive disability in relation to the three bodies, but also acknowledging the ways in which they are constructed by social context. So, um, you know, so, um, you know, at the personal level, uh, somebody has, you know, certain, uh, things that they do or don't do and but that can be that can be made worse or better by social context than interpersonal relations how people are treated what roles they're assigned uh, and then of course institutional there's a long history of cognitive and into and developmental disability <clears throat> pardon me in institutions so I think we can think roughly about the experiences as well as um, the definitions of cognitive disability in relation to the three bodies, but I certainly would be open to uh, various kinds of, of rethinking um, in that area as well. Okay, thanks very much, Julie. This has been a terrific session and uh, I hope that everyone will um, join me in thanking Julie. Thank you very much.